All right, our take a minute is up. You've taken care of all of the things that you were supposed to take care of. Probably. You got two out of the four. That's all right. Pretty good. Uh, yeah. It's a good morning, right? Do you feel distracted this morning? It's kind of quiet around here. Kind of feels like a little bit of a, it, it just feels like one of those days. We got to get our wits about us. We better focus. So get your Bibles out and let's take care of, let's take care of business here this morning in a message entitled Acceptable Worship, a phrase that comes right out of our text, no big surprise. And um, so we're going to be in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. I'm going to wrap this up in this chapter. I want to ask you a question to get started. Uh, the question is this, what's the difference, and again, I, every once in a while I feel like maybe I should say this, in a setting like this, I'm not actually looking for verbal response, I'm just getting you to think, process the information, and then we'll go from there. But that said, what, what is the difference between hearing and listening. They're not synonymous terms. The one includes the other, but the one isn't complete with regard to what we're talking about today. So what is the difference between hearing and listening? So put the def definitions up there. Let's see if you were right. Hearing, this is of course like a dictionary definition, to pro the process of or function or power of perceiving sound, the ability to actually physiologically hear sound waves in your ears, hearing. Listening, on the other hand, which of course would include being able to hear, paying attention to a message in order to understand it and respond to it. See the difference, right? So as we're getting into Hebrews 12 this morning, this is this, the, we're in the end of Hebrews 12. Next week, we will enter into the final month of the series as we enter into the final chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. And the essence of today's passage is not about hearing. It's about listening. I used to tell my kids, listening is a very important skill. Now, you might guess that I said that at opportune times, and they loved it. They just absolutely adored their dad when he would say that. Listening is a very important skill. Um, yeah, they didn't, they didn't always adore that. But listening, the, the key here for us is listening always carries with it the idea of a response. It's not just taking something in, but it's being attentive enough to respond, and I, I suppose we'll say to respond properly in this. So verse 25 through verse 29 is, um, it's the final warning passage of Hebrews. So if you've been with us through the whole series, you know that this this letter to the Hebrews, these are first century followers of Jesus who were, uh, they were Hebrew people. That, that was their ethnicity. That was, their, that was the culture in which they were, uh, their, and they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're Hebrew people. And uh, living in, in uh, you know, Jerusalem and the surrounding areas um, and enduring persecution, challenges, and, uh, and, and so... God inspires the author here, the human author. He inspires the human author to, to write them this letter of exhortation. And, um, and th lays throughout the, this letter, which we, that's been broken up into 13 chapters, lays throughout it are these warning passages. And this is the final, the fifth and final warning passage. And if you've ever re read the letter to the Hebrews, you know there are there are some really challenging th things there. And if you've been a part of this series, we've taken those challenging passages on. It's like, wow, this is, this is tough. 
in some ways, I suppose we could say it's hard to hear. Uh, we wouldn't probably say that now that we know the difference between hearing and listening. We would say in some ways it's hard to listen to. Right? We can hear it, and, but it, and it's a tough message. And so it's harder to listen to it. But what we've learned in these warning passages, though they're, they're tough, is that they're actually good. They're good and they're beneficial. They're meant for our strengthening. And so when we do listen, obviously with the idea of responding properly, when we do listen, then it's life-giving. It's something that ultimately is encouraging us. I, I kind of picture it like, um, like if, you're a, if you're a coach of whatever sport, it, you pick your sport, and you're, you're coaching some uh, athletes, and you know as a coach there's times when you come alongside of them and you put your arm around them and you just say, man, you know, this is, you know, this is a tough season, long season, but you can do it. I'm really proud of you. You're a strong girl. You're a strong boy. You know, whatever it is, what you're going to say. And then there's other times when it's not a come alongside. It's like you get in their face and you're like, what are you doing right now? Like, you got to pay attention. you got to seize the moment. A good coach will get in the face of their athletes sometimes. And they don't mean it. They, they don't do it because they're mean. They're doing it because they believe in this person and they know this person has the wherewithal. They have what it takes, but they need to be reminded. And these warning passages are kind of like, in some way, some of the letter to the Hebrews is the, hey, my shoulder, my arm's around your shoulder, and I'm saying, hey, you got this. And other parts, like these warning passages, it's the coach getting in our face and saying, hey, make sure you're paying attention to what's going on right now because it's really important. And so they keep us on track, these warning passages, they move us forward, they're good. So let's go ahead and read our text, and then we'll work our way through it, starting in verse 25. It says this, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, this is, notice the quotation marks, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus, let, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Wow. Powerful, powerful passage, right? So I, I want to I bring, bring up these verses, and you notice we've done a little bit of work on these so that you can see kind of what, what's taking place. And I want to get us acclimated to it, and then we'll work through it like by way of a, of a sermon outline. But th this, is, this is helpful, I think, for us. So you'll notice first off, it's, um, it's a statement that's very personal. See that you, I didn't want blue. I'm going to go yellow. See that you do not, now here's what you notice, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. So here's, you'll notice this kind of parallel and he's bringing these contrasts. He's speaking, it's a very personal message. There's you, like you as an individual person, it's you collectively, like you as a church, and then there's the we that we see in there as well. So it's got an individual element to it, it's got a collective element to it. There's personal responsibility for sure, right? And you'll notice there's this contrast, there's, there, there's a comparison to they, which we'll talk about who they are, they if they did not, then you, how much less will we, right? And then you see there's something taking place on earth. There's something taking place from heaven. And, and the other thing that we, we would want to see is the, the reality of the, it's, the idea of refusing 
carries out to a rejection. First line, if we, if you do not see that you do not refuse because the end result of that refusal is a rejection, right? So we're going to work through that along the way. But let's go on to verses 26 and 27. And again, we'll look at these contrasts. First thing that we see is there's something going on in the past at that time, and then he brings it into the present, but now. See it? At that time, he, his voice shook. Again, here's the heaven-earth thing as well. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more. This is a quotation from the prophet Haggai, which we'll get there in just a little bit. But there's this promise that there's this coming shaking that is going to be very real. And um, verse 27 he gives us the, he gets us acclimated to this yet once more. What he's talking about here is, is he says it's an indication of the removal of, here it is, things that are shaken. And then he defines those things that are shaken, things that have been made. So the physical creation is going to be shaken. And the reason for that is given in the last sentence, in order that. And it's in order that the things that cannot be shaken, check it out that they may remain. So the things that cannot be shaken are in play. They're already in place. And when this great shaking takes place, that's what's going to remain, the things that cannot be shaken. Okay. So you got that so far? Follow it? You feeling good about it? Look at the last two verses. And of course, we have a therefore, right? Since that's true, then this is what we, this is a response. Therefore, and we got these two, it's a favorite phrase of the author, of the letter to the Hebrews, let us. Let us do these things. Let us engage in this way. Let us, first he says, let us be grateful. And then he says, let us offer to God. We're to be grateful that we are receiving a kingdom. We, collective followers of Jesus, are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, great language, right? And thus, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And then we get this monolithic pr phrase, for our God is a consuming fire. You ready for this? This is powerful stuff. All right, so we're pretty acclimated. We got it. We see what's taking place here. Let's work our way through it. Go back to verses 25, 26, and 27, because what they do is they tell us of how important it is, given everything that's been said, he enters into this last warning phrase, and he tells us how important it is at this moment for us to measure accurately what is at stake. Measure accurately what is at stake. Now, you've probably heard this um, it's, an, it's actually an English proverb. You've probably heard it before. Measure twice, cut once. <laughs> it's really good advice if you're a carpenter of sorts. If you sew, people who, do, who sew, that's really important. Um, it's probably, we could say, good practical advice um, in in general, it's a proverb. Right? It, it's got its specific application, but we could think about that in a, in a real way as well. I mean, who hasn't, who hasn't um, had to go back to the lumber yard because they messed up the cut on the, their last board? And you're like, oh, you, you've got to be kidding me, right? And I'm sure that those of you who, who sew, you've gone back to Joanne's Fabric or where, wherever else you buy those things and because you you messed it up. I actually went recently to Joanne's Fabric and I bought this piece of flannel for, for this little project I was doing and my friends, my mind, it's why, uh, yeah, I am so single-minded. I have to focus. Otherwise, I mess things up. And so I had this piece of fabric, this piece of flannel that I had to cut and I'm talking to my dear wife while I'm doing this, and I shouldn't have, I should have known better, and, and my first, like, I cut, like, 18 inches wrong, <laughs> and I, I, yeah, measure twice, cut once, that's 
the wisdom. Measure accurately what's at stake. That's what verses 25, 26, and 27 is, is telling us. What is at stake? Well, if we're, if we're paying attention, what's at stake is literally our lives. Right? Our well-being is at stake in listening to, listening, paying attention, understanding, taking in a message, and then responding well. That's what's at stake. And how many people are going through life, it's, it's like they're in a, they're in a daze. They're just caught up in the, in the Monday through Friday, and they're looking forward to the weekend, and, and the days go by, and the months, and the years, and it's just, it's like they, they, they don't mean to not pay attention, but it's just life. They just are, they're just, it's almost like they're wandering like sheep without a shepherd, right? But the letter to the church is measure accurately what's at stake, this letter is specifically written to Christians. And so we who are followers of Jesus, we recognize that when God is speaking to us, we want to be very careful. We want to be attentive. See to it, he says, that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And so it's a message that's not just for Christians, though. It's not just for people who are followers of Jesus. Like some, there may be some here, either watching online or, or sitting here in the auditorium. You're not a follower of Jesus, and you're just here. You're trying, to, you're trying to figure it out. You're one of those people who are like, maybe you saw yourself in kind of this daze, and you realize, wait, there's got to be more to life. There's got to be more to me just working and, and resting and, and, you know, celebrating the holidays and all the other things that you do in the, in the rhythms of life. And it's like, this doesn't seem like it's all they're supposed to be. And, and you're like, I got to investigate this a little bit. Well, I would say, great job. You're, you're one, it's great that you're asking big questions. It's also great that you're looking to a, a place or a people or a message that is, um, that is inspired, that's got, that's got substance, that, that if investigated, holds up, if interrogated, holds up, and it has for millennia. And so this message isn't just for people who are followers of Jesus, though it is for people who are followers of Jesus. But if you're not that, this message is for you as well. Measure accurately what's at stake. Your life's at stake, right? Your well-being is at stake, and that well-being isn't, isn't only about life in the here and now, it's life eternal. You, you are an eternal being. Whether, whether you recognize that or not, you will exist for eternity. And so that's what's at stake in this message from this passage. And so we want to be really careful about how we're measuring it. And the first thing we're told is, hey, in measuring accurately what's at stake, agree with the speaker. Now, I know, as, 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 especially as Americans, with our individualistic mindset and we're captains of our own ship, we don't just automatically agree just simply because somebody is speaking. But, but let's pay attention to the text, right? See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. See to it means to be careful. It means to be vigilant, that you're not refusing. And look, look at this definition of the word refuse. This is like... It's, it's kind of an arresting thought. To refuse here is to be unwilling to agree with. So we've got to process that for a second, right? Somebody's speaking. Later in a moment, as we get through the rest of that verse, we find out that it's, it's him who is speaking from heaven. And so we put ourselves in this position where we, are, we see to it, we, we are vigilant, we're careful to not willingly disagree with him. He's speaking. Of course, we need to know what is he saying. No show of hands, but how many of you have ever disagreed with God? <laughs> if we showed our hands, probably all of us, especially those of us who are followers of Jesus, we would have our hands raised. I would, my hand would be up. I, friends, I don't know how many times I've read through the Bible. I've studied through the Bible. 
I have a master's degree in studying the Bible, and I still read the Bible on a daily basis, and so often, not every single day, but so often, I have to pause and go, okay, God, you need to help me with this because your ways are not my ways. The way you think is not the way I think. Now, from there, what do you do? Because if from there, we take the posture of, I must be right, therefore God must be wrong, that's where we get in trouble. Disagreeing with God is not necessarily the issue because this is a part of the process of becoming a follower of Jesus. This is part of the process of becoming more and more like Jesus, where He's reorienting our thinking so that we do learn to agree with God. That's actually the definition, the base definition of repentance is to change one's thinking and one's heart to begin to agree with God. It's to begin to say, God, you must be right, and where I see it differently, I actually must be wrong, right? So, th- so it's not so much about disagreeing. By definition, it's refusing. It's not being willing to agree. So the posture is, if I'm, if I'm measuring this properly, the posture is, God, I, I don't see it like that. So I'm not taking this posture where now I'm thinking I'm right and you're wrong, but I'm taking this posture where I'm saying, okay, I don't see it like that. Would you help me, grant me insight, understanding? It's to take a humble posture. So this is what we're talking about, to agree with the speaker. The one speaking is the Lord Jesus, right? He's the one who's speaking from heaven. Remember, so he's tying things together, right? As he's wrapping his letter up, he's starting to tie things together. So here we remember the first line from the first chapter in the whole letter. This is what it says. Verse 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, verse 2, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God is speaking through his son to, an, to the entire world. And we're really smart when we measure what's at stake and we agree with the speaker. See, in verse 2, Two of chapter 1, it is that God has spoken to us by His Son. But 25 of chapter 12 takes it a little bit further. Simp- it's not simply Him who has spoken, it's Him who is speaking, present and continual. It's not just that God said something, it's that God is saying something. Jesus is saying something to this world. Jesus is saying something to us Jesus is saying something to you. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. He's presently speaking at this moment. So we put the whole verse together, right? As I said, when we're looking at kind of that analysis, to refuse him who, who is speaking is actually to ultimately to reject him who's warning from heaven. See the whole verse there, right? If you refuse him, if you willingly, if you say, I will not agree with you, I'm right and you're wrong, it is a rejection of him who is speaking. So our posture is really important. When we find ourselves in disagreement with the Lord, hey, that's not news. It, it's sometimes a real challenge to to be humble, to allow ourselves to go, I, I, this, is, this is hard to understand. But the posture is so important. We need to be careful. Measure what's at stake. Humbly ask for understanding, etc., to so that you don't refuse. Refusal is not the right response. Okay. So now the author, as we keep, keep going here, the author, is put, he's kind of putting a bow on his final warning, today's passage, and he's tying it back to his initial warning. So, so look here at Hebrews chapter 2. This goes back months and months earlier, like last winter, where we went through Hebrews chapter 2. And listen to this language because it's almost like different word order and such, but it's basically the same language that we're hearing in today's passage. He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. 
For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard. So again, we're measuring accurately what's at stake. Agree with the speakers. The first thing he says, somebody's speaking. It's Jesus from heaven. He's speaking, and we don't want to refuse because ultimately to refuse is to reject. Now, the second thing we see here is to accept the standard. Okay? When we look at this passage of Scripture, the standard has been established from long ago. In fact, we could go all the way back to the first verses, the first chapters in the book of Genesis after creation, and God has established the standard. It's, it, it's not complex, but it, because of our own wills and our own bent away from the Lord and because of the powers that be in this world, cultural powers and all of the, you know, the false messages and all of the stuff that's going on in the world... It's, it's not necessarily easy to accept the standard. We can understand it. We get it. But accepting it is what's being called for here. The standard is simple. Listen and obey. Oh, that's all I got to do. Oh, great, right? Now we get it. If, we, if we'd have just known... Now, I just, I just need to listen and then obey. And we want very much, we want very much for, for there to be this injection of the word understand. We need to listen and then we need to make sure that we fully comprehend everything that's being said before we obey. But it, that's not actually the standard. The standard is whether you fully understand or not, listen and then do what's being asked. And because the way God operates so often, so often, like those of us who are still learning, like the basics, the, the early principles of following Jesus, get this, right? Those of us who have been following Jesus for a long time, we're still working on getting this, but we do understand. We get it. Here's how it works. You listen, you obey, and understanding actually becomes a product of obedience, you gain understanding after you do what you're told. It's remarkable, but it's actually the way God works. And we don't necessarily want it that way, but that's why the author here is telling us, accept the standard. Right? If you're going to measure what's at stake accurately, you've got to accept the standard. And understanding is something that comes after. So, so, so it's wise for us, right? It's wise for us to understand, to, to accept the, 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 this standard. The language is this, if they, referring to the children of Israel, didn't escape, and the escape is judgment. They did not escape God's, we could, we could include a couple of different words here. We could say they didn't escape God's discipline. We could put that in a category. We'd say they didn't escape God's punishment. Punishment, discipline, not synonymous terms, right? Both come from the Lord, but here the children of Israel didn't escape. They didn't escape discipline. They didn't escape judgment. Punitive, right? When they refused him who warned them on earth. Him who warned them on earth was Moses because God was giving the law through Moses. Moses was the mediator of that covenant. So then the comparison is much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. If you've read the Old Testament, sometimes it's really a challenge, right? We have to pan back, see the big picture of what's God doing in his redemptive story because he's telling a whole story of his, his rescue and redemption of, the, of this wayward world, right? What he created was good and right, and then sin entered and tainted things, and humans got bent away from God and rather than toward him, and the image was marred, and the image of God was marred, and, and God has been actively redeeming his world from the very beginning. But when you're in the weeds of the Old Testament and you're reading it, it just seems like half of the whole Old Testament is telling about how the children of Israel experienced God's displeasure for their refusal to listen to him. It just seems like it's constantly, they're like constantly under the discipline or the judgment of God, right? It's kind of a painful story at times. And because the reality is, God warned them. He gave them the standard. He said, this is, this is how it is. 
Here's how you get blessed. Here's how you, here's how you get disciplined. Here's how you get punishment. Here's how you get judgment. And everything God warned Israel about what they would experience, they, ex- they did experience. They experienced everything that God warned about, including famine, defeat in war, failure of crops, disease, and eventually exile. It's, pain- it's a painful story. The standard established by God is very consistent. God actually means what he says, and his warnings are not superficial, right? And the authors, he goes, he kind of presents this from from the lesser to the greater line of reasoning. And it's meant for us to notice that, right? There's somebody speaking from the earth, but now there's somebody speaking from heaven. It's one thing to listen to someone that God has sent your way, and then to not respond well. That's not right. That's not a good posture for us. But when he delivers the message himself and he's not listened to, he's saying, how, how, how much less will we escape? Like the, the refuser at that point doesn't really stand a, a chance of escaping except the standard. The last thing we see in this verse is to adjust for the inevitable. So we're measuring accurately what's at stake, and we adjust for the inevitable. This is really smart. He says, at that time, verse 26, and he's referring back to the account that's outlined in Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 5 with the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And we saw that scene from last week's, it referenced it last week, where this Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai, the children of Israel have to stand from afar, and there's this incredible storm and lightning and thunder and wind and the whole earth in that area is shaking and Moses and all of the people are also shaking. They're trembling with fear at the presence and the voice of God. Remember that, right? And so now we're told as severe as that scene was in its limited scope, it's kind of a one moment in one particular area, we're told what's coming, what's inevitable, is not limited in scope. It's not in a particular area. What's, we're told that there's this shaking coming that is not a natural disaster. It's actually a supernatural disaster. And the author cites, as I mentioned before, this prophecy from the Old Testament minor prophet named Haggai comes out of chapter 2, verse 6, and he says, yet once more I will, not, I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. So the author of the letter to the Hebrews, he, he, led by the Spirit, goes back to the Old Testament and he sees something there. He sees this prophet, Haggai, who has given a message that was pertinent for that moment in that day, but it had, it had a larger um, application, a larger scope. And so he sees this and he utilizes it here. Again, inspired by the Spirit, he utilizes it here to help Christian people understand what's at stake, non-Christian people to begin to measure, hey, what's going on? This world is not going to continue as it always has. There's going to be at some point an abrupt change in what's what, what is life, if you will, on earth? So the context of Haggai's prophecy is the restoration of the glory of God among the people of Israel after their time of exile. That's what Haggai's initial context is. And the author of the letter to the Hebrews takes that prophecy and he extends it out to the, the end time of judgment. There's this coming judgment that he sees, that Haggai caught a glimpse of, and that God is revealing here, not just here in Hebrews 12, but in other places in the Scriptures as well. Jesus even talked about it. In the Gospel accounts, we have that record. That there's not just going to be the shaking of the earth, but the heavens themselves are going to be shaken. The present heavens and the present earth and the order of things as we know them in creation are going to be shaken. And in verse 27, we learn 
the, the result of that, shaken and removed. There's going to be this, this uh, cataclysmic destruction of the present heavens and the present earth, and we're told why at the end of verse 26, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So later we find out that this is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is present. And when the shaking takes place, the kingdom of God will be the only thing that remains. Everything else will be removed. That's why it's so imperative for us to measure accurately what's at stake because if we're not a part of the kingdom, then we will be removed also. We will be shaken and removed. That's why when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, he was talking to them about the profound change that took place. Even though when they look in the mirror, they see the same person that they saw prior to knowing Jesus, he's telling them, in Christ, when you are a person who has received Christ Jesus the Lord, when you are a person who has been who, who has been who has recognized your need for a Savior, that you have recognized your guilt before God and have asked for forgiveness and you receive Christ, the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul writes to them and he says that, that you have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Right? That's why that's, that's so imperative for us. It's not just about, well, I believe in God and I believe in a, good, a goodness, and I, and I believe that, you know, things won't always remain the same. It's always about Jesus, friends. Jesus is the Savior of the world, and there's no way to be saved from this inevitable event apart from Christ. We must trust Jesus for our well-being, right? In order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So the Bible puts this in definitive terms. It's going to happen. We do not know when. Anybody who speculates and begins to tell you that they do, that's when you stop listening. Even if you can still hear them, you stop listening, right? Because they're not right. Because Jesus has told us it's none of our business, right? So if we're measuring accurately what's at stake, we're adjusting then for the inevitable shaking, right? So we're not living. The adjustment is this. We are not living for what will be destroyed. We're living for what will, will remain. Right? That's the adjustment. So this is smart, right? Measure accurately what's at stake. Listen to Jesus. And of course, listening includes responding properly, and that's where verse 28 and 29 go. So let's go back to these two verses. Therefore, his conclusion to what he's been saying is, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So here we're properly responding to who God is. And verse 29, we get a picture of who God is that is, oh, I, it, it's almost like um, we wish that we could experience it. We're told that our God is, I mean, talk about an ominous line. Our God is a consuming fire. And we think, oh, if we could just experience that, then it would help us set things right. It would help us measure accurately and respond properly. If we could just experience that, right? And we think we would, but we'd be probably much more like the children of Israel who are standing from afar and experiencing this moment where God is giving the law and God is doing what He's doing, and they cry out, trembling with fear, we don't want to hear from God anymore. It's too much for us. So Moses, you're the prophet. You're the one that God has called to lead us, so you listen to God, and you tell us what He says. And then we'll obey you, right? And we, we think, ah, if we could just experience this consuming fire, wouldn't that be something? And I, I go, well, I'm, uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little tentative to say that I want to. I just want to believe what it says, right? A consuming fire, friends, is a fire that consumes <laughs> everything in its path, right? It's a raging inferno. 
So I, I recently listened to a book by Timothy Egan. You might, if you're a reader, you like history, write that name down. He's a great author. Um, years ago, I read his book called uh, The Worst Hard Times about the Dust Bowl era uh, during, the gr- during the Great Depression. Tremendous book. Oh, tremendous book. If you read that book, you won't cry about any more hang. You'll never cry about a hangnail again. You'll get a hangnail and you'll be like, it's just a hangnail. It's no big deal, right? The worst hard time. Well, he wrote a book a little bit later called The Big Burn. And man, it's a great story. It's about the establishing of the National uh, Forest Service and uh, Theodore Roosevelt and all of that. uh, Gifford Pin show and all, it's just kind of great, great American history, early 1900s, and there was this, um, there, there, there's this fire, uh, actually, uh, eventually became a fire, but, uh, but initially it was, there was several spot fires up in northwest Montana, and then there was fires taking place in British Columbia, and then fires taking place in north Idaho, and, uh, and the Palouse, eastern Washington, the Palouse was also on fire, and they estimated back in those days. I don't know how they did it. They didn't have satellite imagery or anything like that, but they estimated, if I'm remembering correctly, it was like 3,000 fires. I mean, it was a really, really bad year. And then, in in the perfect storm, like all of the weather patterns and all of the events took place to all just like make it happen to where these all these several thousand fires became one fire. It became, and they called it the Big Burn, and it's this massive, consuming, raging inferno that just destroyed everything in its path. It was, it was, it's a crazy story. So if you're a reader and you like to read that, you, that that'd be great, All right? It's, it's, it really is an amazing story. This gigantic fire that consumed everything in its path, and our Our God is described as a consuming fire. Now, now, again, we kind of think we like that, but we don't really like that. Many people don't take a liking to this idea because the God that they've been nursed on, and I use that word God as a lowercase g, the God that they've been nursed on even though he's been referenced from the Bible, is much more like a recreational fire that you have in your backyard that's self-contained, got some rockery around it or something. Or maybe you're out at your cozy campsite. You know what I'm saying? You got a blanket around you and the fire's just kind of warming you and it's so good. And you got this little stick or maybe a piece of wire and there's marshmallows on the end of it. And you're like, this fire is so great. I just love this fire. I'm just going to cook my little marshmallow over this fire. Right? There's a lot of people, that's, that's their image of God. He just kind of keeps them warm. He's cozy. And I, and I can have some marshmallows. Right? It's kind of nice. Problem is, that's not really the God of the Bible, is it? That's not what we're told here anyway. Huh? Ligon Duncan uh, he's a professor of theology at the Reformed Theological Seminary. In his book, God, Does God Care How We Worship? He said this, There is a God that we want, and there's a God who is, and the two are not the same. Now, friends, understand that you're not exempt from that statement. If you're an alien from outer space and you just happen to be here this morning, then I can't say, I can't apply this to you because I don't know. But if you're a human being, this line applies to you. There is a God who is, and He's not the same as the God that we want. This is, this is real stuff for us. Right? Our God is a consuming fire. That's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 24, he's quoting the Old Testament. In that chapter, Moses commands the people not to take away from or add to the Word of God. In that chapter, he admonishes them to keep their souls with all diligence lest they forget what God has done for them. And in that chapter, he starkly warns them against any form of idolatry. And then he says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. 
God is jealous. Not in the twisted, weird way that humans can get jealous. His jealousy is part of His holiness. He's jealous for His glory, and He will not share it with prima donnas. He's jealous for the affections of His people. An idol is anything that takes God's place in our lives if it receives affection or devotion that is rightfully God's. It's an idol. There is a God we want and a God who is, and the two are not the same. It's like the difference between our backyard recreational campfire and a consuming fire. Again, Ligon Duncan says this, the basic problem of humanity is not atheism, it's idolatry. It's why it's addressed in the first two commandments, no other God but me and no idols. Human beings, John Calvin said, are idol factories. The human heart is an idol factory. It's a constant, it's a constant for us. Measure accurately what's at stake. Respond properly to who God is. That's why the Apostle John, oh, the loving Apostle John, at the end of his life and he's writing his letters to the churches, he's, and he ends his first letter with this phrase that almost seems out of place until we measure our own hearts. He says, last line in the whole thing, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's not just an Old Testament thing, friends. It's not just about those in foreign lands who have bronze statues or wooden, or, or wooden statues of idols that they bow down to. Idols are in the heart, and we must be careful. Earlier in verse 28 and 29, we're told what a proper response is to this God who is a consuming fire, and we get these two things, gratitude and worship. He says, be grateful for what's coming. Therefore, he says, since the physical creation will perish in the coming shaking, shaking, our response isn't grief. Imagine that. Our response is gratitude. Grief is the natural reaction to loss. It's very natural, right? But here we're told, in anticipation of the great loss, that we're grateful. We're not grateful for the loss. We're grateful for what's going to be gained. And that's the key, friends. That's the key for us, making that proper adjustment. If, we're, if, if, if we haven't, if we're, th- this promise doesn't make sense unless we're holding loosely to the things of this world. The tighter we hold to the things of this world, the more we live for the things of this world, the less this makes sense to us. We would grieve. But no, here we're told to be grateful that we're receiving a kingdom. We're gaining a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Right? That's the coming kingdom. And we're invited to be a part of it. It's the surest, sturdiest, most wonderful thing in the entire creation. And it's here. And that's what's going to remain. And we get to be a part of that. And so we're grateful. We're not grieving. We're grateful that we get to be a part of what's coming. The second thing we're told here is to offer God acceptable worship. Actually, it's not just a second thing. The language is and thus. And thus. So we follow the language, right? So we're grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship. And thus means in this way. In this way, then, we are offering God worship that is acceptable to Him. In what way? Well, by listening to Jesus because He's speaking from heaven, which includes an obedient response, and by being grateful recipients of the coming kingdom, we offer to God worship that is acceptable to Him. It's a complex passage, but we get it. This boils down to this. Now, the Bible has a whole lot more to say about what acceptable worship is, but this text tells us that, if we, that God accepts listening and gratitude as worship. That's what this text says. That's our big idea this morning, that God accepts listening and gratitude as worship. Right? It's the proper response to who God is. Listening to what He's saying and being grateful that we get to be a part of what He's doing. 
And we do this with reverence and awe, with a profound respect for God, for who He is, and in fearful wonder, right? And in this state, when we're in that state, in that state of reverence and awe, then the tainted things of our own souls, things like entitlement and vanity and ego and selfishness and hypocrisy, those begin to get consumed by our God who is a consuming fire. So we're going to wrap this up. One final thought on what is acceptable worship because one, there's a couple of scholars who this is what they pose. They, they, they pose, they suggest that all of chapter 13 is the author's description of what acceptable worship is. Now, uh, what I've said that this passage, 25 through 29, really tells us listening to the one who's speaking from heaven and responding properly to him with gratitude that we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that is acceptable worship. But I like where these scholars are going. So I want you to keep that in mind as we get into very practical stuff in chapter 13, very real life, everyday stuff, relationships, money, marriage, all of that sort of stuff is in chapter 13. And how we live that out is a description of acceptable worship. So keep that in mind as we get into the month of November in the final chapter. All right, so let's wrap up here. We got it, right? Now, I'm a I'm a month late. Actually, I don't know if I'm a month late. We just, here's where we're at. But I, I understand that September was National Preparedness Month where you know, there's uh, government agencies and such that help people through, through some promotions on how to be prepared for disasters and emergencies and that sort of thing. Like, make sure you're storing up some food. Make sure you've got some clean water. Make sure you've got, you're prepared for whether it's a you know, a winter storm or an earthquake or whatever. Like, be prepared. And so, I, so this here's the website, ready.gov. That's a website for you. It's a great place to start. I think, that's, I think that's good, practical, smart stuff. Be prepared for natural disasters. But, of course, our text isn't really talking about natural disasters. So if September was National Prepared preparedness month and you didn't get prepared, take the month of October. You've got a couple days left. Get prepared, right? Some dehydrated food and some water and that stuff lasts until, you know, just about till Jesus comes back anyway. So, but it's a good idea, right? There could be some shaking coming. There's crazy stuff going on in the world right now. So it's a good idea to be prepared. But it's even more important to be prepared, not for a natural disaster, but for a supernatural one. Because that's coming, friends. That's inevitable. I hope the others, I hope that we don't experience those. That's my hope. But this one, there's no chance of us, there's no chance of not experiencing it. The natural world will be shaken and removed in order that the kingdom of God will be established. Be prepared for that. That's of utmost importance. Let's bow in prayer. You get it, right? If you're not a follower of Jesus, give your life to Jesus today. Right this very moment, give your life to Jesus. Say, say, God, I, I need your salvation. I need your hope. I need your forgiveness. I want to be a part of your kingdom. And if that's your prayer, hey, talk to somebody who has a lanyard on. Make a note on your connection card. Talk to the friend who brought you today. Let today be the day. If you are a believer, take a second measurement of what's at stake. Have you measured accurately? Are you responding properly? Are you in disagreement with God on anything? And what's your posture about that? Are there things in life that if, if you knew that this supernatural disaster was coming. If you, I mean, it's coming, but if you knew it was going to happen, say, before the end of the year, what would you change in life? What would you do differently? What would you start doing? What would you stop doing? Reality is you should make those adjustments. Just begin to pray. Ask the Lord to help you. Grateful to be a part of what God is doing not self-centered, not, not entitled, not distracted, grateful, grateful. 
that we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, offering to God acceptable worship. Father, thank you for this group of people who have taken in. They're not just hearing, they're listening. And I ask you by your spirit to guide each one to respond, to measure and to respond. Solidify your work in us, Lord. Cause us by your grace to take steps forward in our growth, in our obedience, in our gratitude. Jesus, you taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And so, Lord, that is our prayer. And we pray it in your name. Amen.